My name is Matthew Lodge. I'm the Vice President of Cloud Services, uh, the product management and product marketing teams at VMware. Uh, so this is everything you wanted to know about vCloud hybrid service, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, so uh, we did uh, something a little different for this presentation this year, where um, we asked questions uh, online. So we uh, opened this up. We had an online form. We had Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all that good stuff. And we asked people to tell us what they wanted to know about vCloud hybrid service. So that's how we developed the content for this uh, presentation. And we're going to continue that theme uh, throughout. So I've got a few late breaking questions, things we collected from the web form and from Twitter uh, over the last uh, couple of days. And uh, we'll also do a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so feel free to ask any question you like if you don't see uh, your question covered in this uh, session. And in terms of agenda, so uh, the first part is uh, me talking about the service and uh, answering the questions that uh, we got, so covering um, the major questions that I got from uh, ahead of this uh, session. Um, so we're going to take, so what problem are we really solving? What, what's vCloud hybrid service really about? What does it let you do? Take a peek under the hood, looking at pricing, packaging. That was a common question. We're going to do a brief demonstration. Um, I was having a little difficulty this morning, so I've got my fingers crossed that the networking gods will be with me here <laughs> for, for the demo piece. Um, and then also I'm going to invite uh, Angus Gregory and Andreas uh, Antonio. Did I get that right? Thank you. Uh, from a company called Biomni. So, um, uh, sorry, Biomni. Biomni is uh, a service management software um, producer uh, out of London. So they're one of the first uh, customers outside the US to do, use vCloud hybrid service. Uh, so we collected some questions for them about their experience using the service. So um, the guys are going to talk about that. Uh, and I'm going to point you to a few more sessions, things you can go uh, read or sessions you can go to. Uh, and then we'll get to uh, Q&A. So what problem are we solving? Well, what we saw happening in many organizations, and this was really what was driving uh, cloud forward, uh, was this gap between what the business wanted to do and what the IT team was measured and gold upon. You know, Carl this morning in the general session doing the demonstration talked a little bit about this. But the idea, you know, line of business very much focused on how do they grow revenue, launch new products and services, uh, go into new markets. And the IT team very much focused on keeping the lights on. How do you make sure that all of the applications stay up? How do you reduce costs? Um, being held accountable for you know, the security of the infrastructure. So a very different set of goals for the two parts. You know, the business is all about trying to grow top line revenue growth, uh, turnover. And the IT organization is, is going to be penalized if there is any problems, anything goes down, the lights go out, any of those other things. So you've got this tension. Uh, between the two. And so what we were trying to uh, solve with the cloud hybrid service is, is there a way to span both? How do you get the agility that the business is looking for with a platform that gives you that reliability, uh, security, uh, and the, all the things you expect out of VMware infrastructure inside your own data center? So vCloud hybrid service, just to be super clear about exactly what it is, uh, it's infrastructure as a service. It's a public cloud from VMware. So VMware operates everything from the infrastructure up, as you can see here. So it's uh, the vCloud suite, right? vSphere, vCloud director, compute storage, networking, uh, all of the things you would, you've uh, come to expect from VMware. Uh, we supply also the operating system and the application catalogs, uh, the web console, and vCloud API, and you bring along your own tools, your own virtual machines, and in some cases, your own licenses. So vCloud Hybrid Service is designed so that you can bring unchanged your existing virtual machines that you currently run in your own data centers. You can just copy those across and run them as is. You can do that with any kind of software uh, that you own. Licensing is really the only limitation uh, to that. Right? So the licensing of third-party software tends to be the only limitation in terms of what you can and cannot bring to the service. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, it's designed to be completely consistent with what you run inside your own uh, VMware infrastructure. So uh, these are, you know, it shows you all of the compatibility from top to bottom. So everything from the vCloud APIs, for those of you who are running something like vCloud Director, 
in your own data centers. It's the same API. Uh, the catalog is the same. Uh, so we have a catalog synchronization tool. I'll talk about that later on. But you can sync the catalogs between vSphere and vCloud hybrid service. Um, virtual machine format is the same. It's OVF. Right? So OVF and OVA files that you would use uh, in, in vSphere today, uh, you can just copy those up. Uh, obviously, the hypervisor is the same. It runs on vSphere. And then firewalls and IP addresses. You know, the net we're using uh, all of the great stuff that you saw about NSX. Um, that's what this service is built on. So a very aggressive adoption of that. So complete virtual networking. You can bring your own IP addresses. You can build arbitrary network topologies, virtual networks, switches, routers. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later on. But you can use exactly the same IP address space that you use. It's completely private networking. And you can also build uh, to network topologies that mimic what you have in the physical world. So you can create multiple firewalls, connect them together, build isolation for your applications in the same way that you would do that in your data center, but it's all done in software. And then finally, you can also extend your layer two, uh, your, extend your network at layer two. So you can bridge your network from your vSphere VMs uh, and vSphere infrastructure over to vCloud hybrid service. Uh, so layer two network extension is, is kind of a neat trick. You, know, but you can also do that at layer three, obviously. You can build a routed network. Um, but you can bridge the network so that to the applications, it all looks like it's one data center. Same IP address range. You can even move applications and have them keep the same IP address, move them from vSphere over to vCloud hybrid service. So two flavors of service. Uh, first one is dedicated cloud, and, and the uh, other one is a virtual private, which is a multi-tenant service. So what we're selling today is subscriptions for capacity. So it's a little different to other public clouds you might have used, where they're essentially selling VMs. And VMs are fixed sizes. We call it the t-shirt model, you know, like small, medium, large virtual machine sizes. Well, what we saw is that most of our customers don't, that's not what they have in vSphere today. They have VMs of all kinds of different sizes. And in some cases, it's useful to be able to change the size of the VM while it's still running. And so in vCloud Hybrid Service, we sell you a pool of capacity, memory and CPU and disk. All right, so dedicated cloud minimum size is 120 gigs of RAM, 30 gigs of CPU, 6 terabytes of storage. And multi-tenant is 20 gigs of RAM, 5 gigahertz of CPU, 2 terabytes of storage. In the dedicated cloud case, it's fully isolated compute. So you essentially have dedicated servers uh, just for you. Uh, it's your own instance of vCloud Director. It's not shared with anybody else. Uh, so completely isolated, physically isolated at the compute, and then shared networking and shared storage. Virtual private cloud, the virtual private piece refers to the networking. It's a fully logically isolated, full private networking, but it's multi-tenant in the sense that your VMs are going to be running on physical servers when other tenants can be on the same physical server. The advantage of virtual private cloud is obviously that it's cheaper because we can share that infrastructure across more tenants. Dedicated is more expensive because it's dedicated to you. But those are the two trade-offs. Dedicated is obviously better for isolation and for a regulatory, um, uh, regulatory issues where you need physical isolation, or regulations, I should say. So I've got some US uh, costs here just to give you an idea. We're, um, the reason I'm not showing you the cost for the, for the new UK data center is because I don't have those approved from my friends at Legal yet. Uh, but it gives you an idea of like what kind of price point we're at. So these are in US dollars, so you can think about the conversion into euros and you can sort of get an idea for where that is. So dedicated cloud, if we take that pool of resource and we say, well, how much is it going to cost for a gigabyte of memory and a gigahertz of CPU, what, what, what price is that going to be? Do the, do the maths on that. So roughly 10 to 13 cents an hour for dedicated cloud, and four to four and a half cents for multi-tenant. Uh, support, you can see the, the fee there. Um, disk, so a gigabyte per month, 13 uh, to 17 cents per gigabyte per month. And I'm giving you these price ranges because the more you buy, the cheaper the service gets. So the more capacity you add, the price comes down. So that's where that price range is. And then you can see the cost for bandwidth. And then uh, what we provide included in the service, so free when you buy the service, is firewalls, load balancers. We don't charge you for disk I.O., uh, VPNs, DHCP, NAT, all the network services. All of that is free. 
right? So you can create um, gateways, uh, create uh, additional virtual firewalls, or load balancers. You don't, you don't pay any extra for those. The other important difference with VCHS versus other clouds is redundancy and high availability. So these prices get you redundant VMs. So we're using the same technology you're familiar with, vMotion, DRS, so that we're giving you redundant capacity. So you get a virtual machine that's on a server that's running HA DRS, running vMotion. So if there's any server congestion, we're going to vMotion VMs around to relieve that. If we need to take a machine out of service, there's some kind of hardware problem, we can vMotion all your VMs off that, take it out of service non-disruptively. We won't have to take your VMs down. If there's any kind of catastrophic hardware failure, then we'll restart all your VMs automatically the same way that DRS does. Right? They'll be crash consistent with where they were right before the failure. So all of that is included. It's all automated. And that's very different from most public clouds, where you don't get any of that. There's no redundant capacity. Your VM can go down at any time. There's no automatic restart in those other clouds. So one of the things is take advantage of what vSphere brings, right? Give you more reliability. Um, management, let's talk about that. So uh, the other question we got was like, can I use my existing management tools? And that's one of the biggest challenges for a lot of organizations in moving to the cloud is that you can end up with a completely different management approach uh, for cloud versus what you have in the data center. Uh, so you can use uh, any of the tools here. So vCloud Automation Center, we just announced uh, 6.0 yesterday. Um, so we have an update to the service coming out next month, and you can use vCloud Automation Center 5.2 and 6.0 uh, directly with vCloud Hybrid Service out of the box. Um, so you can have vCloud Automation Center essentially be your single pane of glass to use that uh, phrase that everyone's looking for, the one place you, you go to manage everything. And that can be your uh, console into vCloud Hybrid Service. Uh, second thing is uh, vSphere clients. So today we have vCloud Connector. I'll talk a little bit more about vCloud Connector shortly. Um, so that's a plugin for the vSphere client, the Windows client. Uh, let you manage VCHS from a tab inside the Windows client. You can also transfer VMs, and I'll, I'll get into all of the, the features and functions of uh, vCloud Connector. Uh, also, in December, uh, we're announcing uh, we'll introduce a plugin uh, for the vSphere web client. So you can manage VCHS from the web client just like you would manage your existing vSphere infrastructure. And then uh, in the first quarter of next year, uh, you'll be able to manage VCHS from vCenter operations. And essentially what we're going to do there is extend the vCloud API to give essentially a performance API that vCenter operations can query. So you can manage virtual machines running in vCHS from vCenter operations. Now, those of you who've or, uh, used that today you know that there's a lot of physical management that's part of vCenter operations. You're looking at hosts and you're looking at physical characteristics. Now, obviously in the cloud, you're not going to see that, right? We're abstracting the physical infrastructure away from you, but you'll be able to man you manage all your virtual machines, all of the same uh, things uh, that you look at in terms of um, the health, uh, the risk, the efficiency, all of those other, those other uh, statistics that you get out of uh, vCenter operations to be able to get for vCloud hybrid service. Uh, so another question is great. So sounds fantastic. So how do I get my VMs into vCloud hybrid service? How can you help me do that more easily? Um, the, perhaps the easiest way is you can just copy the VMs across the network. So vCloud Connector, the plugin uh, for the vCenter client, uh, has WAN acceleration uh, built into it. So what we do is we take your VM out of vSphere, compress it, send it across the network. Uh, I'm using a WAN acceleration protocol that's a lot faster than TCP IP for bulk data transfer. Uh, and we send it in multiple pieces. We send, you know, open multiple connections. So try and get that, you know, as fast as possible across uh, the network. Um, and it just copies it directly into vCloud hybrid service. If you've got lots of data, then we offer offline data transfer. And essentially, that means you ship as a disk. So you use vCloud connector again to essentially dump out the contents of the vApps or uh, the things that you want to, to send to us, the data. Uh, just put it on a disk and you ship it to us and we upload it to the service. Uh, so if you've got lots of data, we had customers in the beta who were doing things like uh, D, uh, DNA analysis and, and genome sequencing. They had lots of data. 
and never underestimate the bandwidth of, of FedEx or, uh, or DHL, right? Um, the other thing that vCloud Connector will do for you is uh, the, the layer two data center extension. So uh, we'll build that layer two bridge between your vSphere network and uh, vCloud hybrid service. Uh, so what we're doing here is setting up an SSL VPN uh, between VCNS, vCloud Networking Security in vSphere, out to VCHS. So you need to have VCNS uh, running uh, in your vSphere installation. You need to have that installed and operational. And that, so that gives you one end of that uh, SSL VPN connection. The other one terminates in the edge gateway that's part of VCHS. So um, when you do that, you're essentially bridging a vApp network back to the data center. Uh, and then that looks like a single network. Well, you can also do this thing we call a stretch deploy. That's where you copy the virtual machine across and you give it the same IP address and the same MAC address in VCHS. So once you bridge the network, it looks like one network to the application, and so you can move the application over without changing its IP address and run it in a different place, which is kind of a neat trick. Um, <laughs> there are some challenges associated with that when you're, you're stretching a layer two network. Obviously, then the routing doesn't change, so all the traffic is going to continue to go to your data center and then across that SSL VPN to VCHS. Uh, but for applications where you really can't change anything and they're dependent on IP addresses, uh, it's, a, it's a really neat feature. You can also do just a regular IPsec VPN uh, from anything that will terminate IPsec. It doesn't have to be VCNS, any, any device that you have on one end and then terminate the other end in, uh, in VCHS. We're also uh, uh, implementing uh, what we call Direct Connect. So you can get a, a dedicated private line or MPLS connection from your data center into VCHS. So not across the network, but dedicated networking connectivity. And then finally, the other thing that vCloud Connector does for you is catalog synchronization. So synchronize the catalog from vSphere or from vCloud Director in your data center across to VCHS. Uh, and this is very popular for folks who are doing development and test, where you're generating new golden images that are going to be tested uh, in, uh, in the cloud, and you want to make sure everybody has exactly the same images, right? It's the same thing that everyone is testing. Uh, and it just simplifies the management of catalogs. It's also useful when you've got corporate images for a particular application or an operating system. You can make so sure that VCHS is up to date. Your VCHS catalog is up to date with what you're using in vSphere. Uh, so when you change, it's a publish and subscribe mechanism. So when you change the, uh, the contents of the catalog in vSphere, then they get copied over to VCHS automatically. And then the other question I got was, you know, what's, what's under the covers, right? We got lots of questions about what kind of hardware does it run on. When, um, so when we dig around and we ask people why do they want to know, it's really because you want to know, is this thing going to perform well enough to support my applications? At the end of the day, that's what everyone cares about. So I want to talk a little bit about the architecture underneath, uh, some of the things that we've done to um, give you really great performance. So uh, if we think about our, uh, the, the physical construction underneath, um, so the servers support up to 112 gigabyte VM size, so it's a pretty large maximum VM size. Uh, most clouds don't get anything close to that, but again, we found customers with very large VMs. Um, and then each host has 20 gigabits of aggregate bandwidth, which is divided up into three virtual networks. So there's a storage network, the Ethernet uh, network, and vMotion. Uh, so we're taking advantage of virtual networking, so these are uh, VXLANs uh, to do all of the uh, isolation of the traffic. Uh, and we're also using I.O. control in vSphere uh, to avoid congestion. So you don't want your storage network to be um, compromised by a burst of traffic on your Ethernet network and vice versa. And you don't want vMotions to step all over your storage traffic. So by using I.O. control, we can manage the contention between these different kinds of traffic and make sure you get good performance for all three categories. The storage itself, it's a single hop to storage. Uh, we build out the physical construction of the, uh, what we call a shard. Um, is a combination of compute and storage. You put them next to each other. That's the other way that we can improve storage performance, because what we see, again, in other clouds, the storage network is a long way, often, sometimes in a different building, 
to the compute. And so every network hop that it goes through is an opportunity for congestion. Uh, and that contributes to poor storage performance. So we physically put them next to each other. And we can limit also then the tenancy across uh, the storage. And when we do that, that means we can use things like flash to accelerate uh, the disk. So the flash is used as a cache for, for recently used uh, objects, uh, blocks in the, uh, in the disk. So we've got ex flash accelerated storage. Uh, then on um, the networking side, you mentioned this before, um, VCNS and NSX, so software-based, software-defined networking. So switching, routing, firewalls, VPNs, load balancers, all that implemented in software. You want a new firewall, you just create one. And finally, on the vMotion network, I mentioned this before, but fully automated, you know, aggressive HA and DRS uh, to give you that redundancy and the performance optimization I talked about before. Question about security. Uh, so this is the current snapshot of where we are with security certifications. Uh, so ISO 27001 is the, the key one uh, for this part of the world. We also have what's called SSAE 16, which is a US uh, standard um, for uh, security controls for data centers. SOC 2 and 3 uh, is part of that, so we're compliant to that, so if you want to look that one up. We also have the American um, Healthcare uh, Security Standard HIPAA, the Health Information Portability and Accountability uh, Standard. Uh, again, all of these essentially are sets of security controls, physical and logical, uh, and we are building out um, our audits against all of these different standards. So we implement a standard set of controls, and then certification is a matter of going through an audit with a security auditor to demonstrate that you have met, you have the right controls in place, you've met the standard uh, for that. So the next one up is PCI DSS, so that one's underway right now. Uh, and then we have uh, FISMA Moderate, which is a, a US uh, federal uh, standard. So we're continuing to expand the security certifications over time. It takes time to get through audit, uh, get the sign off from all the auditors, and you have to do that in each data center. So you'll see that list of certifications get longer over time. Um, other things in here, you know, I talked about networking a little bit before, but uh, data that's in motion, IPsec VPNs, you can build your, your firewalls for, for network security. Um, you, can, it's, uh, you have uh, redundant edge gateways. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with uh, the edge gateway in VCNS, we're running in redundant mode. And also dedicated connectivity gives you that full isolation. So the next question is, so what can I run on VCHS? Because you know, I mentioned licensing is often the restriction or the limitation uh, for what you can do. So we uh, think about this, and, and there are really three things. So first of all, anything that you can run on vSphere, you can run on VCHS, right? So today, 2,000 ISV or independent software vendor partners, 3,800 applications, 90 operating systems, anything you can run on vSphere, you can run on VCHS, because it's exactly the same as it's the same thing you have today. The question then is, great, but you know, what does the licensing say about that? So we think about it in three ways. The first one is bring your own license. So this is increasingly possible, uh, and all of this depends on the licensing policy of the software vendor. So we're writing licensing guides. So we're starting with the most popular, most requested applications and operating systems. Uh, so uh, I'll show you in a second. We publish licensing guides for those. So one or two pages kind of give you the quick summary of you know, here's what you can and can't do with that particular vendor and that particular software. So for example, uh, some of you uh, will have a license from Microsoft that allows you to bring Windows licenses to VCHS. But you can only do that on dedicated cloud because that's the limitation of the Microsoft license. So we give you a brief two-page guide that sort of tells you, you know, here are the things to look for. And then the full glory of the Microsoft licensing agreement is where all the details are, but we're just trying to give you the, the basics in two pages. Second thing we do is uh, if we, you can't bring your own license, then oftentimes we can license, we can sell you a license of, uh, by the drink, subscription license to the application or the operating system out of the catalog. So today we have all the Microsoft uh, operating systems, uh, SQL Server, um, all of the things that we can license from Microsoft, we can turn around and license them to you. So you can um, essentially start, if you use those templates out of the catalog, then you're charged for the, for the usage um, of that application, so by the drink. Uh, so 
all the usual suspects here, Microsoft operating systems, uh, Red Hat, Suzy Linux, all of those other good things are in the catalog. And then the third area is uh, what we call application marketplace. This is all our first version of the application marketplace. Uh, these are virtual appliances uh, that you can download from third party software vendors. You buy a license directly from the vendor. Uh, so all of this is in the, what we call the hybrid service marketplace. So if you go to vcloud.vmware.com, which is the, the main site for vCloud hybrid service, you'll see a link there to, to the hybrid service marketplace. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, so here you can see the front page. Um, these licensing guides I was telling you about are on this link here, purchasing options, bring your own license. So you click on that and it, shows, those are the, uh, it gives you the licensing guides for that. And then you can browse by different categories. You know, here we've got some of the top applications, CentOS and so on. Uh, so you can learn about each of these. In some cases, you can download a virtual appliance. Other cases, you have to go directly to the vendor. But there are about 2,000 different applications in this today. All right, so let's do the demonstration. And I'm going to cross my fingers at this point. And let's see if we can show you what the service looks like. So what I'm doing right here is logging in. And then I'm going to switch over. <laughs> and we'll see. we'll see if the network works. It was pretty slow before. <laughs> this is not what I wanted to see. Let's try that again. There we go. All right. So um, this is the web interface uh, to vCloud Hybrid Service. So we built a new web user interface. Um, you have um, lots of different ways you can manage the service. You can manage it entirely through the API. So if you, for example, if you use vCloud Automation Center, that's exactly what's happening under the covers. vCloud Automation Center is making API calls to the vCloud API uh, to, to run and manage uh, the service. Going through the web user interface, there's also the vCloud Director interface uh, is available. But um, you can see this is our uh, little test area for product management. You can see these are, our, these are the resources that we have available on subscription how much of that is used. Um, we've uh, used all our IP addresses here. We've got our virtual machines. Uh, key concept here is the virtual data center. And this is how you can take the capacity, divide it up, and give it to uh, different groups inside your organization. Um, so a whole bunch of things in here. This is my uh, virtual data center. And um, so this is me. Uh, I've only got one virtual machine in here, which is a uh, WordPress install. But you know, here are my VMs. I can go in here and do my snapshots, power on, power off, uh, revert, all of those other good things. This is the link that will take me into vCloud Director. I can manage it uh, directly from there. Here's the API URL. So for those of you who are into programming or have tools that uh, can use the vCloud API, that's, there's the URL for this virtual data center. Uh, so you can call the API and manage it. And then for networking, um, you know, here's my gateway um, that I have in here. I can see um, here, this is how I can add NAT rules, firewall rules. Here are the networks that I've got, public IP addresses. If I go back to the gateway here, these are all the gateways that are available uh, inside of our, uh, uh, our account here. If I go back to my dashboard, oops, screwed up my navigation there. All right, so I've got two networks in here. I've got uh, an isolated network. It's not connected to the edge at all. This is useful for in internal traffic, so things that you don't want to have uh, be anywhere near the public internet. And this is uh, a routed network uh, I've got set up. Um, there's the gateway address, default IP, the address range for that. And then you know, here are my public IPs. Uh, so basically, this lets me build out. These are two virtual networks. I can add more. But this is what lets me build out that virtual networking capability and, and uh, connect my applications to virtual networks, build the isolation I'm looking for, um, build out my, uh, my firewalls, and so on. And then a quick, quick spin around users. These are all the folks who are uh, able to uh, 
uh, who are part users of this uh, particular uh, cloud. And if you have clouds in multiple locations, uh, then they show up as different virtual data centers. And if, if we, we don't have it uh, here, but uh, if we had capacity in the other data centers, you would see regions show up in the user interface. And you can go take a look at regions and see all of the different clouds there. And then across uh, everything that we have, um, all of the v these are all the VMs that are running in this today this is in the product management team. So you get a view across everything. And then we can also see all of the gateways. I showed you that before. So that gives you a, sort of an idea about what the service looks like and, and how, it, how it functions. It gives you some idea of the concepts as well, virtual data centers, gateways, uh, and how you connect those things together. So that's the, that's the extent of the demo. If you want to go to the booth, you can get much more um, detail. And we, can, we can show you more. Uh, the folks that I can help you out with that. I'm going to switch back now, hopefully. All right. So um, we uh, asked folks to contribute questions. There were a couple of things that came in um, after the deadline for slides. So I wanted to um, uh, just put these on a, on a page and just uh, work through these. Um, so the first question is, uh, will you have the subscription model and you're selling essentially pools of capacity? Why don't you do pay-as-you-go, credit card, uh, like everybody else? And, and we will do that. Uh, we started out with a subscription model initially. Um, it's, a much, it's very partner-friendly and it's very predictable. You know exactly what your charges are going to be on a monthly basis. We're in the process of implementing pay-as-you-use. Will, we will get that capability next year. Uh, second question, do I need a private cloud to leverage vCloud hybrid service? The answer is no. If you've got vSphere, you don't need to run vCloud Director or vCAC or any of those things. You just need vSphere. You've got vSphere, you've got VMs, you can use vCloud hybrid service. In fact, you really don't even need vSphere, technically. But if you want to bring your own applications, then uh, you just need vSphere. Uh, next one, can admins get user reporting? So this seems to be about uh, audit trails. So the answer is yes. There's an audit trail that you can pull out of the user interface so you can see all of the actions that were taken, uh, so you can track who has done what in your instance. Um, next one, does vCloud Hybrid Services support the Cisco Nexus 1000V? The answer is no, um, because we're based on NSX and, and v vCNS. Um, so we're using the virtual distributed switch um, and, uh, and not the, the Cisco Nexus 1000V. Uh, next one, when we have data centers in my country, wherever that is. So our data center build out, we're starting in the UK. So uh, Slough is the first data center in the UK, so west of London. Um, we'll add additional data centers in the UK for redundancy. Um, and then we're taking a look at the rest of Europe and other countries that we want to move into. So we haven't made any decisions on additional countries yet. But we're certainly very interested in hearing uh, from you the locations that will work for you and why. Uh, so we hear about compliance issues, data locality, sovereignty, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, let us know on that front. What can you tell us about the underlying hardware? My company has requirement for specific vendors. Um, so we're not going to tell you a lot about the underlying hardware for a couple of different reasons. One is that it'll probably change over time. But fundamentally, in cloud, it's less about the underlying hardware. It's more about, does this service meet the performance objectives for my application? Um, so we'd encourage you to test your application. Um, do your own performance testing. We'll give you performance benchmarks. We've had uh, a third party uh, cloud benchmarking vendor uh, do a bunch of tests for us. But the best test you can do is actually to is try the service and see if it works. And we'll certainly we, you know, we'll share the kind of information I shared with you earlier on about the underlying architecture. But we're not going to get into make and model of equipment. All right, uh, so what I want to do now is ask um, Angus Gregory and Andreas Antonio to uh, come up They're from uh, Biomni. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Round of applause, please. Thank you come down here. So I asked these gentlemen to, to come up because they're uh, early users of the service. And so, Angus, uh, why don't you just give us an introduction to, to, to Biomni and what you guys do? Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm Angus Gregory, C uh, CEO of Biomni. We're a software vendor based in the UK. Uh, we provide a service catalog and request management solution, typically to large enterprises and uh, service providers. And that solution is really aimed at allowing organizations to design and publish the services that you provide to your users, your customers, 
uh, to enable them to provision those services as if they were browsing Amazon. Uh, that, that's the solution that we, we provide. Um, uh, typically, it's a, it's a global audience that we, we service as well. OK, great. Thanks for the introduction. You want to step forward a little? <laughs> You're the CTO. Come on, man. <laughs> All right, so what I got here are some uh, questions that came in from, uh, uh, from, from our customers uh, about your experience, right? So we're going to walk through these different questions here, and I'm going to ask, uh, ask you guys to, to tell us what went on. So let's start at the top. So why did uh, Biomni decide to use the service? What, what were you thinking about Angus you know, from a business perspective? Why don't you talk about that? Sure. The, the challenges that we were being uh, faced with on a regular basis was um, our customers were constantly asking us, could you integrate your solution into this particular product, or could we do a proof of concept? And the challenge that we were faced with was it, it, was, it wasn't predictable. We, we never knew when those requests were coming in, and of course they were always urgent. So that meant that we were having to buy new hardware, more kit, or reuse an existing uh, uh, setup that we had. So that meant that we had to pull staff off uh, and say, do you remember that project that you started off last week, which was highly you know, uh, high priority, well, that's not a high priority anymore, we've got to use, we've got to do this. So it was a constant challenge that we were faced with, moving kit around, people around, buying more equipment. Uh, the other thing that we faced was uh, expenses. I was constantly getting expense claims in saying, we've just signed up with this cloud partner that uh, we needed uh, some extra compute um, because we had to, to, to do this project. Um, so working with our partner, Computer Center, who uh, had uh, early visibility of a hybrid cloud, they came to us and said, well, actually, there's a different way of solving this problem now. Um, actually, you, you are, all your uh, uh, software is based on VMs. We, we're heavy users of, of, of VM. Uh, so why don't you look at this hybrid cloud? And actually, when we looked at those, uh, the, the, the business reasons for doing it, for me personally, on the business side, it was a no-brainer. It just, it just made absolute sense to, to move to this, this particular uh, solution. OK, so the compatibility was a key. You think? It, it, it really did, and, and, and not only that, for, for, and, and Andreas will, will uh, vouch for this, but you know, from, from, a, from a business thing, it made sense. But then when I got the technical people involved and they said, do you know what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis using the, the vCloud and, and vSphere, et cetera, everything that you're doing there, you can just move into the cloud. And for them, that was, that was the turning point for me, where they said, this is a no-brainer. You know, normally, you get people going, oh, no, we can't do this. It's, you know, it's going to be complex, et cetera. When they looked at it, worked with our partner, Computer Center, actually it became a when can we have this that type of approach. Okay. So Andreas, let's go to question two for you. So what use cases, what workloads uh, did you put on the service? Um, well, it, it's really about development and test for Biomni. Um, as an right. ISP, we have uh, a lot of demand to build new projects, integrate our product into third party products. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly facing demand to uh, build new integration adapters, and that requires new infrastructure. And we, uh, we've spent a lot of time improving our software development process. So we're incredibly agile and very responsive to the way we build software. And we just can't afford to stall that if we hit the buffers right. on, uh, on, on infrastructure resources. So you know, there's, a, there's a lot of times where we kind of have to wait on IT to stand up new infrastructure resources. Mm -hmm. and basically, hybrid cloud just allows a little bit of a, a release valve on that. Right. And we can stand up new uh, resources very, very rapidly. So um, the, okay. you know, the, the use cases we choose basically is we've got a, a V app, which is, is basically our own application. It's a web app DB type uh, structured application. Right. And we just establish that in the cloud, establish a couple of those, and then do some of the performance testing on that. OK, so I think, I think you told me before, so it's a .NET application, is that That's right? That's right, yeah. And you have it set up as a V app, so you, so you just transferred the V app over? Yes, yes, okay. just copy that over, yeah. Great. Right, so uh, question three, what steps did you take to prepare your internal infrastructure for vCloud hybrid service? Well, um, yeah, we've, we've got a couple of vSphere uh, environments at the moment, a couple of data centers. Uh, one's a vCloud, one's just a, a vCenter. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, hybrid service is just another data center. So it had no impact on our existing data centers, which right. is great. 
Um, what, what we did do, though, is obviously we wanted to connect to the hybrid service so that we can both transfer workloads over on an ad hoc basis and make use of it, and then also um, allow us to network into it. So any VMs that are stood up in the hybrid service, being able to link to those from our internal network. So it's those two connectivity type issues that we addressed via the vCloud connector product mm -hmm. and right. via the VPN configuration. So those are the two main pieces of work that we had to address. Okay, so you used IPsec VPN? Yes. For, yes. A, for a tunnel and then use vCloud connector to do that transfer? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I'm, I think you might have already covered this, but what was included in your proof of concept implementation? Yeah, so, yeah, as I mentioned, your proof of concept, yeah. very much standing up our own application. We know, we know the performance of it. It runs on our own internal data centers, so we right. established that in the hybrid service. We could see the performance, which was, was pretty acceptable. Right. And we had a few of those running and, and run tests on that. So an existing uh, application, well understood. You can yeah. test it out and see how it performs in yeah. the cloud hybrid yeah. service. Okay. Challenges, what, 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 kind of, what kind of things? This is, this is the worrying question for me. So what challenges did you face? Well, <laughs> <I'll start. laughs> because, because the platform is so familiar to us, our IT guys are used to, used to managing vSphere. Yeah. Uh, used, they're used to the uh, management tools, vCloud Director. So there wasn't really any technical challenges that were faced. It's okay. more, more of a process type challenges, I reckon. It's, uh, it's more about understanding which workloads we position where, right. and the decisions we need to make around that. And so you're already familiar with vCloud Director, and that, yes, that yes. made it easy for you guys? Yes, our, okay. both our internal development teams and our IT teams are very familiar with them. Right. Okay. I think just to add to that, Matthew, yeah. actually, one of the one of the things that, from a business perspective, is, you, you know, because it is so easy and it's so familiar, um, one of the things that, uh, that that I want to ensure is that we don't give the sweeties out too too soon to, to all the staff. <laughs> so actually, you can build in processes and uh, and say, well, when it comes to standing up these instances, where are they going to be stood up, and what's the what's the reason for it? So right. actually, having some some business. Um, uh, approval rules effectively in that process is, is, is something to think about up front because obviously you know you, you, you are spending money on the on the hybrid cloud and right. it is so convenient uh, then people go well I'll have a bit of that thank you very much so you know seeing <laughs> seeing your uh, allocations there was is, is something people should think about when they do it so, yeah the virtual data center construct is pretty pretty useful for that you can give somebody a set of resources they don't have to ask permission all the time when they want to use those and deploy VMs, but they're constrained as to the maximum amount that they can use, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Um, management issues, cloud sprawl that are common when adopting cloud. You want to talk well, to that? We, we have had uh, instances where you know, project managers have an urgent need for, for resources and IT has just not been able to meet that, meet that need, just don't have the bandwidth to do that or our internal resources are those buffers. Yep. So they've gone out and used their own personal credit card and bought mm -hmm. Amazon AWS VMs and you know the, the, the clock's ticking on that. We're incurring costs and they're charged back as expenses. Yep. And obviously that, that resource is not managed by our IT teams. The, the security, the compliance is all you know, not as we, what, what we would like it. So you do get this sort of sprawl of different, um, different uh, cloud vendors being used by various people and by Omni. Having the hybrid service there just allows us to standardize that more okay. and reduce that ad hoc usage of these other cloud services. Yeah, I think, um, I, mean, Ang I mean, Angus, that's actually one of the things that your tool does. So you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, well that, that's right. But actually, before I talk about that, actually, one of the things with the public cloud that we have found is, is that because it is incredibly easy to get the credit card out and, and, and subscribe to any one of those, uh, it is also incredibly easy to forget that you've done that. Right. And actually, you know, we've had the instance where the project manager has forgotten that they created this, this server in, in, a, in a particular public cloud, and they've forgotten to turn it off. So yeah. it, you know, it, it, it is ticking away. So they've come back and said, well, sorry, but my expense claim is going to be a bit higher this month. Um, so that goes away. You know, that, for me, that goes away with, with yeah. the hybrid cloud. Um, so, and and with, with, with our solution, you know, one of the things that we're talking to, to our customers about, the service providers in particular, is they're looking at using our solution on the front end, the service catalog, to, to manage that process of right. allowing staff members or, or their customers, in the case of a service provider, to have a, a single interface to, to bring up these instances, request these, these VMs, and go through a business process of why do you need it, and then, then somebody making that decision of whether it's going to be deployed on a particular uh, data center, whether that's private or in, in the cloud. So I think that's, um, 
you know, from us, we, we, we're excited about the, the, the challenges that's solved for us in our business, but actually we're also excited about the opportunities that we're working with our customers. Uh, you know, all of, all, all of our customers that are using VMware, the, the, the vCloud, et cetera, can now see an opportunity to have that nice consumer type front end yeah. interfacing into the likes of vCloud, hybrid cloud, et cetera, uh, and also the automation tools that, that, that yeah. you, you guys have. And that, that's something that we're really looking forward to working with. That's great. Okay, next question. What's the learning curve for moving a workload um, from an existing environment to vCloud hybrid service? Well, it, it, it's, uh, you know, there's not much learning. I mean, if you're familiar with, <laughs> with uh, vSphere and vCloud right. Director, and, you know, it's, uh, it's very, very easy. Once you've established that vCloud connector um, appliance or you know, yeah. gateway or whatever we want to call it, it's very, very simple to you know, browse your, your various uh, VMs in one environment and copy them to another. Um, and once we'd established that, you know, it's a very, very simple, simple exercise. Okay, great. And then uh, final question, best practices. Um, Angus, do you want to lead off on that? I think you talked about process. Yeah, I think, I think I've touched on some of the best practices. Again, it's, it's, the, it's the, the business rules, yep. um, uh, ensuring that people are, are uh, using this resource uh, in the correct way. I think that, uh, that's something to establish early on. Um, you know, it, and also publicizing the fact that you do have this capability and stopping that cloud sprawl that you know, the credit cards being used uh, is also quite key. So having some mechanism in the business to say, this is a service that we can now provide. We do have the burst capability. Whether, whether it's for, like we're using it for, uh, initially for development and, and test, et cetera, and, and working with our customers to solve some of those, those bandwidth issues that we had or whether you're looking to use it for disaster recovery. I think you know, quite a few people I've been talking to think that that's actually going to be a great option as well, you know, right. disaster recovery type uh, environments. Um, and, and it's having that business process that you can look and see, well, how, how are we going to use this in the first place, rather than it's just, oh, it's another, uh, it's another tool that we've got, and isn't it nice and easy to spin up VMs? I think putting some uh, good um, case studies together and, and working through those. And because it is so simple, as Andre says, to to actually stand up in the first place. It becomes a no-brainer to sort of do a pr proof of concept. And even if you start off on the, on the, uh, the shared infrastructure, uh, it's quite easy then to, to expand that and grow it into, into other areas and then move into a dedicated environment. And, and again, you could have different um, uh, data centers. You know? So as, as the data centers grow, you could uh, it, it solve some of those, um, those, those uh, uh, sovereignty issues uh, as well. Right. Uh, and maybe having different data centers because they, they're just seen as another data center in your, in your, you know, in your list. Right. So that, that's another thing to, to think about. Okay. Andreas, anything to add? Um, not, not really. Best practices, I suppose, just starting off, you know, start small, start with something you know, right. give it a test, dive in and, and, and try it out. I mean, it uh, okay. seems to be the best way to start. Great. Thanks for answering those questions. Um, what we're going to do is a quick plug. Uh, for a few more sessions. Uh, so there are five sessions that uh, make up what we call the Jumpstart program. Some of these have already occurred because of the difference in timing between this session and those other ones. But you can, all the presentations for these are available online. And I think a lot of these also have been uh, videoed. So you can uh, watch these at your leisure or go to the sessions themselves. And it's, this sort of takes you from the basics all the way through to the advanced topics like networking, advanced networking. Um, and then there's also uh, hands-on lab for vCloud hybrid service, the jump start for vSphere admins. So you can take that again at your leisure in the hands-on labs. And at this point, I want to uh, thank you all. And then we're going to uh, open up for a Q&A. So we have some microphones and uh, so everybody can hear the questions. But um, any questions for me or for these gentlemen? Yes. It's just this gentleman here. Do you have a microphone? They're going to bring one from the back. Give me a second. It's down here. <laughs> this, gen this gentleman here with the scarf. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So I'm from telco sector. And uh, actually, one of the reasons I'm here is to try to figure out uh, if it makes sense to offer these services, these VMware cloud services, as a kind of a syndication partner. I know yes. the models from, from Microsoft, for instance. What I saw so far is very interesting, but it looks more like a direct sales model. Is that correct, or do you have any plans of uh, providing that to partners 
so that they net, not only can build a service, but they, that they also can provision the service. Does it make any sense in, in your model? Yeah, so great question on partnership. Uh, so yes, we absolutely have a partnership model. I think you know, Angus mentioned Computer Center. So they're one of our launch partners for this. So uh, this service is sold through the same partner channel that you would buy your vSphere software from. Um, it's, uh, it's a smaller set of partners initially, uh, and then we are, we're going to expand it out to the entire partner community. But if you want to resell the service, we can certainly talk to you about that. Other questions? OK, so let's go to the uh, gentleman in the blue shirt first. And then we'll have somebody else over here. We'll come to you next. Thank you, guys. Do you see this as being used just for like primary VM storage, or do you see like some SRM integration for kind of DR as a service integrating into that as well? Great question. Um, so we uh, announced in San Francisco, we talked about uh, a DR service that we're, is currently in development and will go into beta um, before the end of the year. Uh, and it's based on vSphere replication. So essentially, you can replicate your VMDKs from vSphere into vCloud hybrid service. Uh, and then uh, run those directly in VCHS. So when you have a disaster event, uh, start those up. Um, it's, not the, it's not the same as SRM. Uh, it's being built by the same team that does SRM, but it's actually a, di it's a different product because if you ever used SRM, it's very um, array-centric. Um, and then what we wanted to offer in VCHS was uh, dissimilar hardware. So you can replicate from any storage uh, into VCHS. Uh, so that's what's in the pipeline, um, and that will go to general availability uh, first quarter of next year, and we start the beta in, in a couple of months. There was another question over here, I think. Oh, gentleman in the back there. Hi, just a quick question on versioning. Do you have to be running 5.5 to use VCHS? Can you run, if you're on a back version, does it still work? How, how's that going to work today and in the future? Yeah, great question. So today, uh, anything 4.0 and above, um, you don't have to be running the same version. So the way we do this at VMware is we have uh, the virtual hardware versions, if you're familiar with that. So if you've got a, v a VM that's under 4.0, and you can bring this into vCloud Hybrid Service. Uh, vCloud Hybrid Service is, is running, uh, today is running 5.1. We'll be upgrading to 5.5 over the next couple of months. Uh, and so you can upgrade the virtual, uh, the hardware version of that particular VM. But you don't, you don't, you're not forced to do that. Uh, if you upgrade it, then you can take advantage of the new features that are in the later version of the virtual hardware. Gentleman down here at the front. Uh, thank you. I don't know if I missed it at the start. I mean, how do you assign IPs, external IPs to VMs um, when you provision them? And is there a limitation on the number that you can have? Right. So uh, external IPs, you, uh, you get um, a certain number of them bundled, depending which service you buy. So if you buy dedicated, you get three um, external IP addresses, and you can buy more. So IP addresses, you know, we buy them from the registrar, essentially turn around and resell them to you. Um, so they're fairly cheap, but they're, as, as everybody knows, IPv4 addresses are a commodity now, so, they're <laughs> so we have to charge for those. So you buy more external IP addresses. And they're um, managed by an edge gateway. So you've got your IP addresses assigned to um, a virtual data center, essentially, and, and the edge gateway associated with that. And then uh, you set up either a NAT, uh, a, typically a NAT rule for, for VMs, because uh, all of the traffic from a VM goes through the edge gateway and then out to the public internet from there. So that's how you assign an IP address. Yeah, question here. Uh, VMware being a U.S. company, um, a lot of business can't um, put uh, data in your data centers even if they are based in the European uh, Union or in Europe. So taking the uh, service provider question further, is there any plans that you have a European service provider offering the service, not via VMware? So um, the service is offered by VMware UK. It's out of the VMware UK legal entity. So it's under the jurisdiction of UK government and the European Union laws. Um, so uh, that, I don't know what else to say. Um, it operates like a European entity or a UK entity. <laughs> if you think that European entities are immune from American you know, um, law enforcement requests, they're not. <laughs> that, that's my question. That can only be handled if it's a European service provider. 
Yeah. And not the um, it's a European legal entity. If if we have uh, the you know if you uh, have a legal request from from law enforcement in the U.S., then it has to be passed to the local legal entity, and it has to conform with uh, the laws and regulations of the U.K. and the European Union. It, it's under U.K. law. Yes. Do you have a protection against denial of service type attacks? I'm sorry, do you have any? Protection against denial of service attacks. Yes. Um, so we have DDoS prevention at, um, at the data center level. So all of our connectivity to the public internet is DDoS protected. Uh, and so we, we, just, we just do that as a matter of course. It's part of our service level management. Uh, gentleman over here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you mentioned, you know, VCHS is uh, HIPAA and uh, ISO compliant. So based on that, do, do you need any compliance management on top of that just to ensure that you are compliant or it is like out of the, out of the box it is compliant? So the compliance that we uh, offer is um, we do all of the audits for our infrastructure. All right, so uh, the objective there is so that you're confident that we have all the right security controls in place. The auditor has audited that and said, yes, those controls are in place and they're functioning as designed. That's what ISO 27001 is about. And then for your own applications, you know, obviously we control everything up to the infrastructure layer and then your application itself is probably going to be subject to other controls and you'll need to do security audit depending on what that application is, what regulations you're under. So we give you everything we can about the infrastructure. We can give you all the audit reports. We can tell you what the con uh, control sets are. So your auditor can see everything. You know, they can get the report from VMware. They can see the infrastructure secure. And then they will want to see additional controls for whatever application you're running and, and whatever control set you're subject to. OK, question over here. So um, I have a question about um, backup and restore. Yes. Um, I totally trust VMware not to destroy my virtual machine running up there, right? <laughs> um, but there may be other um, circumstances where you would need to do a restore. For yes. example, a manual error done in a VM or whatever. Yes. Right? So can you tell us a little bit more about the options regarding backup and restore of virtual machines running up there? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we have a backup service in beta today, and it'll be generally available in Q1. Uh, so I didn't show you that in the um, user interface, but you can uh, set a backup policy um, uh, and enroll VMs in that in, a, uh, in automatic backup from VMware, and then you can restore again from the user interface. So we will offer that as a as a service, and I say it's in trials right now with the first set of customers. Yep. Anyone else? Yes, just one question. Yeah. Can, can I run Oracle on, uh, on, on your service? Sure, you can run Oracle. You wouldn't be properly licensed, but you can run it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, a, that's the flippant answer. Uh, um, you can, uh, so Oracle's licensing, as I'm sure you're aware, is per hardware instance, right, per server. Uh, so in the dedicated version, you, would, um, you could create the minimal size dedicated uh, instance of VCHS and you could run Oracle on that and you would have to pay Oracle a license for that physical hardware. Um, you can't run it on the multi-tenant service, be, uh, well, well you can run it but you can't be licensed on the multi-tenant service because Oracle doesn't support multi-tenant licensing. Right? They insist on it being uh, licensed for every physical host that they can potentially run on. So even with, v, with vMotion in the mix, they would insist that we license the entire estate and that's just not economic for anyone. So. Um, we are tr trying to work with Oracle to get better licensing terms and get something that's more cloudy. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be successful there. So that conversation is going on with Oracle because uh, I, you know, I think they're also seeing the shift to, to cloud. Yes. Hi, um, I've got two questions. One, just a quick follow up on the backup. Um, yeah. Is there a separate storage charge for backup storage? Yes, there is. To start using it, so yeah. it's an addition. Yeah, so our, charge, uh, our uh, model for uh, backup is we charge you per front-end terabyte. So the terabytes, uh, so the terabytes protected. Okay, and the, the second question was, 
in the um, VCHS catalogue, if I was to download an application from the catalogue and pay for, pay for it through the catalogue, yep. can I then run that um, image in my local site, in my HQ? Unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, because, and again, it's just to do with the way that uh, we're licensed. So, for example, with Microsoft, well, it depends what it is, actually. But if, let's say Microsoft, uh, let's say you, you deployed Microsoft Windows from our catalogue and then move that back on premises, you would technically be in violation of Microsoft's licensing agreement. Um, we have a, uh, it's called Service Provider Licensing Agreement, S SPLA. We are licensing under that, and unfortunately, it's not transferable to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, gentlemen in the back again. I know it's early days on, on pricing and packaging and all that, yeah. but is there a vehicle to be able to use um, you know, ELA type capacity that you've purchased to, um, you know, to leverage that into VCHS or yes. when are there plans to do that? Yep. Um, and we already have customers who've bought VCHS as part of ELAs in the States. So yes, you'll be able to add it to an enterprise licensing agreement. Is it a new, is it, an, is it covered under existing ELAs or is it a new, um, ELA that, that needs, needs to be sort of re-signed to, to have that? So um, contractually, you need to, um, it, you would add a new component to the ELA. So yes, you would have to uh, sign a new agreement. And you also have to agree to the terms of service. So contractually, we have you know, terms of service for VCHS in addition to your licensing agreement. But you should talk to your account manager about that, and they can walk you through it. Because it depends what kind of ELA you have as well. So. Okay, is there some? Oh, maybe not. All right, she's waving at me. Okay. <laughs> well, time's up. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time and attention. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thank you very much.